Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Arnold A. Salzman Institute of War and Peace Studies. My name is Ingrid Gerstmann and I'm the Assistant Director and I'll be serving as your host today. We are very excited to hear from Peter Andreas and Severine Autisser on Peter's book, Killer High, A History of War in Six Drugs. We had hoped to host Peter last spring, but the pandemic interfered. So we are delighted to get another chance to do so today. I'd like to introduce our moderator, Severine Autisser. Severine is an award-winning author, peace builder and researcher as well as a professor of political science at Barnard College and a member of the Institute of War and Peace Studies. Her articles have been published in Foreign Affairs, International Organization, and the New York Times, among others. And she is the author of The Trouble with the Congo, Peaceland, and her new book, The Front Lines of Peace, An Insider's Guide to Changing the World, will be published by Oxford University Press early next year. We hope to host an event for her at that time. Severine has been involved intimately in the world of international aid for more than 20 years. She has conducted research in 12 different conflict zones and worked for Doctors Without Borders in places like Afghanistan and Congo and at the UN headquarters in the US. Her research has helped shape the intervention strategies for several UN departments, foreign affairs ministries and NGOs, as well as numerous philanthropists and activists. She's also been a featured speaker at the World Summit of Nobel Peace Laureates and at the U.S. House of Representatives. <clears throat> Thank you, Severine, for moderating today and for bringing Peter to Columbia. I will hand things over to you now. Let's, you're, you, you're muted, so let's get you unmuted. I'm so sorry, that's a really that's bad okay. start. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Ingrid, for this very kind introduction. Thanks to all of you for joining us for this event today, and thanks especially for Peter for agreeing to, uh, to participate in this event, al although we had to postpone it by six months. Uh, we're really, really glad to have you all with us today. And so let me introduce uh, Peter. You saw his bio, but let me give you the highlights. Uh, Peter is the John Hay Professor of International Studies at Brown University. He's the author, co-author, and co-editor of 11 books, uh, every one of them better than the others. Uh, Peter's most well-known books are, I would say, Smuggler Nation, uh, How Illicit Trade Made America. It was elected by Amazon and Foreign Affairs as one of the best books of 2013. And Peter has also written a memoir that was extremely, extremely popular and well received. Uh, it was entitled Rebel Mother, My Childhood Chasing the, Chasing the Revolution. And it was published a few years ago and selected again by Foreign Affairs as one of the best book of the year. Uh, it's a really, really good read. And Peter has also published in the top scholarly and policy journals in our field. So scholarly journals like international security, policy journals like foreign affairs and foreign policy. And his work also appears regularly in the popular press. So you may have read some of his pieces in Harper's, Slate, uh, the New York Times, The Guardian, and so on. And today, we're privileged to have him, have him, him spend an hour with us to talk uh, with us about his most recent book, which is entitled Killer High, if you can say it. Um, and it's a really important and timely book given the current political situation. Uh, in recent years, we've heard a lot about policymakers and practitioners and people getting worried at the idea that drugs are aiding terrorists and insurgents and traffickers and gangs all around the world. And the thing is that uh, the discussion usually focuses on today's conflict, but most people ignore that drugs have influenced, fueled, or been, or, or been sprayed by war, not just over the last few decades, but actually over centuries. And so Peter will tell us all about that now and what that means today for us and for present and future conflicts. So here is the plan. Uh, I'm gonna interview Peter for about half an hour uh, so that he can tell us more about the relationships between drugs and war. And then we're gonna open the floor to Q&As for about another half hour. So, Peter, 
Uh, hi. To start, um, do you want to tell us uh, a little bit about uh, your book and especially tell us what it is about and what inspired you to write this book? First of all, thank you, Severine, for that generous introduction and also um, for rescheduling. Uh, we, we did get disrupted last March and uh, canceled quite a few things. This is, I should say, I'm a, I'm a rookie here uh, on the Zoom end. I've, this is the first um, first public event I've done on, on Zoom and certainly um, on the book. So I kind of put the book aside in much of my professional life, frankly, for a bit. Um, so thank you for restarting the, the my book talks. Um, the, the book is, is, is captured by the subtitle, A History of War um, in, in Six Drugs. And what it really does is, is try to unpack the relationship between mind-altering substances and warfare across time, across place, and across um, substance. Um, and in, one way to look at it is it retells the history of war through the lens of drugs and simultaneously retells the history of drugs uh, through the lens of war and, and, and um, show how drugs have, have and war have grown up together and actually have become addicted to each other, uh, arguably. Um, one Tilly-esque way of, of phrasing it is, is drugs made war and, and war made drugs. Uh, I don't wanna overstate uh, or oversimplify, uh, but that, that line uh, kind of is an undercurrent through the, through the, through the whole book. Um, you know, the, the history of war and the history of drugs tend to be treated separately in most of the literature. Um, and so, you know, in some ways a modest move on my part is to say, let's, let's put these two stories more front and center and, and show their interconnection and argue that you really can't understand one with fully without understanding, um, the other. Uh, the other, I should point out, I mean, we'll get into more of the details in the discussion, um, but what I do in the book is not just point to six particularly important war drugs, if you will, we'll, get, we'll talk about why, um, but also unpack the relationship between war and drugs in terms of um, five different uh, dimensions, if you will. Uh, one would be war while on drugs, literally the use of drugs uh, in wartime by both civilians and combatants. Uh, the second would be war through drugs, which is fundamentally different than war while on drugs. War through drugs would mean using drugs to fund conflict or use drugs as a weapon of war. Um, third would be war for drugs, literally going to war for drug markets. Um, the opium wars is sort of the quintessential example of that. Um, Fourth would be the war against drugs. I don't mean it just as a metaphor, the war on drugs, but literally using military methods and personnel and strategies to, to combat an illicit substance. And then last but not least, and this was probably the part of the book that um, I found most eye-opening uh, in, in researching and writing is drugs, you know, drugs after war, how, how war had a profound long lasting impact on um, drug production, drug preferences, drug trafficking patterns, and, and so on. So um, we can obviously talk at more length, but I'll stop there and, and see if next question. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Uh, that, that's super interesting. And I know that you've worked on this book for years. And one of the things that I absolutely love when I do this kind of in-depth, long-term, year-long research uh, uh, is that I discover a lot of things that I would never have thought about. Uh, uh, there are a lot of sur surprises, a lot of new things. And I'm sure that you've experienced that when you were researching Killer High. So what was the most surprising aspect of your research? Yeah. Um... I would say two things if I can say two instead of one. Um, one would be, I just assume going in the conventional narrative that the drugs war relationship is about gangs and warlords and state funded insurgents and terrorists and so on. And so at the end of the day, the most surprising thing about the book research ended up being the main argument of the book, which is when push comes to shove, it's been states, especially powerful states over time that have been the biggest beneficiaries of the drugs and war relationship. Um, you know, we're, we're fairly um, 
historically uninformed in today's debate about the drugs war nexus. But if you bring history in, um, on balance, it's, it's clear that the, the big powerful states, I mean, we talk about narco states today, uh, but the first narco state was arguably uh, Great Britain uh, in terms of its, um, the importance of, of alcohol taxes, cigarette taxes, the opium trade, uh, tea, meaning caffeine. Uh, in fact, Britain was not just the first narco state, but arguably the first narco empire. Uh, so this was really um, uh, uh, one of the biggest surprises. The second uh, was, again, going in and given my background, I had, uh, had a bias towards uh, illicit drugs, studying illicit drugs and the political economy of illicit drugs. Uh, and again, bringing history more front and center it's the legal drugs that are the most important, not to diminish the importance of illicit drugs like cocaine and, and, and uh, opium, but on balance, um, it's alcohol, it's tobacco, it's, it's caffeine that uh, really were the movers and shakers in the, in, in the overall drugs war relationship. Uh, I mean, again, they all matter. That's why I tell the story in, through six drugs, uh, but the legal ones, have an outsized role and importance um, that is often overlooked. So much so that, you know, we don't even often think of caffeine as a drug, but it is, it's certainly my drug of choice. Um, and uh, alcohol, I might certainly, uh, I don't know about my drug of choice, but I enjoy it. Um, but the point is that, you know, taxes on alcohol, for example, you know, built up empires. The, the czar could not have, you know, Russian czar could not have built the largest standing army uh, in Europe without vodka revenue for example, uh, just to give one illustration of the, of the importance of, of alcohol rather than say, you know, cocaine. Yeah, that, that's fascinating. And I would never also, when I, when I first picked up your book, I would never have thought that you cover alcohol and, and tobacco and, and all of these licit drugs. And one of the things that I found particularly striking in your, in your book and that I'd, I'd like you to elaborate on is that so you, the whole book is centered on the relationships between war and drug and how they really go hand in hand. Uh, and I'm curious, what is specific about drug that make them, what, what, is, what attributes of drugs may make them particularly potent war ingredients? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're obviously uh, commodities, but they're very special commodities in the sense that um, they're highly, tend to be, they vary, but they tend to be highly portable. Uh, they tend to be uh, 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 habit forming. Uh, they tend to be highly profitable. Uh, they tend to be, not all, but many of them tend to be highly taxable by states. Uh, and so uh, these, these combination of attributes make them particularly uh, potent war ingredients. Uh, they also, their, their, their mind altering effects also uh, prove convenient and useful uh, both on the home front and, and the war front uh, in terms of calming nerves, celebrating victories, uh, soothing defeat. Uh, there's, of course, medicinal uses, but also recreational uses. Um, so they're commodities. So this is, in, in some sense, this is a political economy book of commodities and war. But it's, it's a particular kind of commodity and with particular attributes that, that make them conducive to facilitating war, not causing war, but certainly facilitating. But then if, if we think about all of the drugs that have these kind of attributes and, and that are particularly potent uh, to facilitate war, uh, I could think of a lot of different drugs. And in your book, uh, you focus on six specific drugs. So can you tell us why you decided uh, to focus just on these six ones and not on so many others that you and yeah. I and a lot of people in this uh, Zoom call might have thought about or see network in conflict zones? Yeah, I mean, uh Going into the research, I'm agnostic on, on which drugs to choose, right? What the historical record has to sort of guide my, my choices. Uh, I, in fact, it wasn't until much, very late in the research process that I decided to organize the book around a narrow set of drugs. But through the process of the research, you discover the outsized role of particular drugs. And then you say, well, why are these particularly important? And they're really all six, and let me just tell you what the six are. They're alcohol, tobacco, caffeine, opium, amphetamines, and cocaine. 
Those are the six, ranging from licit to illicit, uh, synthetic, natural to synthetic to semi-synthetic, um, highly potent, potent to fairly mild. Uh, but what, what holds them together and why they're sort of stand out and, and deserve a sort of, you know, organizing the book around them actually, is um, just these are truly mass produced, mass consumed, globalized drugs uh, in a way that others are not. So for example, uh, you know, sure, uh, cot is, is hugely important for Somali pirates, right? And, and in probably the drug of choice in the Horn of Africa, but it's regionally confined. It's not a global uh, uh, drug. Um, my biggest, if I add to what, one of my other biggest surprises was um, cannabis, marijuana doesn't make the cut as sort of a, the top six, but I, but if I added a chapter, I, I would have certainly um, added it, but I was struck just by the research. I went in going, going in thinking, of course, there's gonna be a chapter on cannabis, uh, but relative speaking, to the, compared to these other drugs, it's just not as been as important. Um, in fact, what's striking is it's historically most important drug war role is as hemp for rope for naval warfare. Uh, and that's obviously has nothing to do with its psychoactive effects. That's simply, it's a fabulous fiber. Um, and uh, it's not to say there's no role of marijuana in, 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 in war. I mean, you know, Napoleon's troops brought hash back from Egypt, introduced it to Paris, right? Uh, American GIs smoked plenty of pot in Vietnam. So there's clearly a role there. It's just, um, I was underwhelmed by its importance compared to these others. Okay, so marijuana was off, uh, was out, uh, but then, uh, so you have six drugs and I'm wondering, is there one that particularly stands out above the rest? Oh, I would say easily alcohol, booze. I mean, basically, you know, alcohol is the oldest drug in terms of mass consumption. Um, it goes back to uh, antiquity and the very origins of civilization itself. In fact, the, the establishment of, of grain agriculture. Uh, beer was one of the first uh, products of, of that. And soldiers all the way back to uh, antiquity were actually sometimes paid with beer rations. Um, and uh, so most of the drugs I talk about in the book are only over the last 500 years or so. Some even more recent, like like synthetics, just the last century. Um, but alcohol goes further back and is more widespread, and has had more um, wide-ranging uses. I mean, just as a hugely important form of taxation for states, but also in terms of just alcohol rations for soldiers, their importance pre. Uh, uh, conflict and, and post-conflict as well. So it just, it just really stands out. Again, the others do in their own way as well, but alcohol is really sort of the all-purpose drug. It's, it's double-edged. I mean, basically it leads to, you know, um, uh, soldiers use it to, to give them confidence, but also it can lead to drunk soldiers who are incompetent. Uh, so it's, it's, it's double-edged in that, that respect. Right, and, and I want to ask you more uh, later about uh, drug consumption on the battlefield, but uh, still I'd like to stay with the idea of cannabis that you had to leave out. And I'm wondering, are there other drugs that you thought that you would uh, include in the book or that everybody is asking you about and then you decided not to cover them in the book and, and why didn't you include them in the book? Well, cannabis is clearly one I thought I would include in the book and I was okay. shocked to find out that I didn't, but others would, would include, um, you know, hallucinogens, uh, <laughs> LSD and people say, well, yeah, the CIA experimented on, on mind control with LSD and that's true. Um, there's even books written about that. Uh, but I guess if you really think about it, it's not too hard to imagine why hallucinogens haven't been particularly conducive to war. <laughs> I mean, it's just, you know, it's, it, you, it, it, it wipes you out, uh, takes over lots of time. Um, governments have never figured out how to tax, tax the stuff particularly well. 
Um, these are niche drugs. These are not mass produced, mass consumed. Um, sure, there's examples of, you know, in Siberia, you know, part in some some cultures uh, using hallucinogens to prepare as a ceremonial ritual before before conflict. Um, but but this these are this is not at the global level the way these other drugs are more niche drugs um, often highly localized and embedded in local cultures. Um, okay. so, yeah, so hallucinogens and cannabis are the ones that stick out. I should also emphasize that this is restricted to psychoactive drugs. So some people might say, well, geez, penicillin, hugely important, right? Mm -hmm. Why didn't you include that? No, no, this is, this is all about mind altering drugs, not about drugs such as penicillin or, or other such drugs. Right, and, and you tell us that you've been focusing in, in the book uh, on drugs that have been uh, really important over the past 500 years, although alcohol has been important for much more, much longer than 500 years. Uh, but right now, today, what are, which drugs uh, continue to be really at the heart of wars? Yeah, it's interesting. All six that I cover, you know, historically remain hugely important, not in in different ways though. So alcohol, historically, a sort of core taxed drug for state coffers. Now it's, since states have diversified their revenue base much more, it's not nearly as important as it was say in the 19th century and, and earlier. Uh, also governments no longer provide alcohol rations typically. So, uh, which, you know, historically was quite important. Uh, but still alcohol is important, um, just not as much as it was before. Um, Cocaine uh, is arguably the single most important illicit drug in terms of militarizing the war against drugs and also um, enriching traffickers who've essentially been able to build up private armies, often with former soldiers. So these are essentially, you know, wars between trafficking organizations and between the state and traffickers. And the single most important drug in that case is cocaine. Uh, not the only, but certainly the lead drug in terms of fueling today's conflict, say in Mexico, for example. Um, uh, synthetics, hugely important. Amphetamines, um, you know, uh, the U.S. military still uh, prescribes uh, amphetamines to some degree. Um, not again, not as important as it was, say, in World War II or, or during the Cold War. Um, caffeine. Uh, I'm as hooked on it as, as, as anybody, but I should emphasize that military bases across the world, I mean, you know, the favorite drink is often these hyper-caffeinated uh, um, uh, uh, beverages, you know, uh, jo uh, jolt, but also um, there's a range of them that uh, are, are just three or four or five times more caffeinated than say a cup of coffee. And you started telling us uh, a little bit about uh, the, how drugs influence performance on the battlefield. And, and you said that the six drugs that, uh, that you cover in your book uh, continue to be very influential today. So are they still influential on the battlefield and how do they influence soldiers' performance? Yeah, I mean, what's interesting is some of the drugs that have been important historically on the battlefield are, are, are no longer, um, tolerated on the battlefield as much. So alcohol, because because soldiering involves use of more sophisticated equipment and expensive equipment and coordination, um, a drunk soldier is more of a liability than it was a few hundred years ago, uh, frankly. Um, so it's it's bef before battle that alcohol still plays a role in, in, in war rather than actually being drunk uh, uh, while soldiering uh, in, in, in the battle itself. Um, Synthetic, I mean, arguably there's a war on sleep in the military right now. I mean, basically trying to find, I mean, the, the, the role that um, amphetamines played in World War II and after is partly keeping soldiers energized and moving and motivated and not needing as much sleep. And to this day, a big issue in the military is, is dealing with, with sleep and how to get the most out of your soldiers with the least amount of sleep. And so uh, synthetics remain, uh, a popular um, provigil is a new drug that's come out in the last 10, 15 years uh, that, is, that is quite popular. Um, 
and uh, amphetamine type stimulants uh, continue to be used. But what's interesting, historically, this was mostly state-based, but you can see in, in Syria and elsewhere, amphetamines, captagon, uh, have sort of leaked onto the battlefield, if you will. Some of it actually is, is counterfeit uh, drugs, but used um, by rebels in Syria and, and others. And uh, when, when you started telling us right at the beginning of our discussion, you started telling us about uh, what, the, the way you framed the book, and you said that the last chapter was the one that you found the most, uh, I can't remember the, the word you used, surprising or interesting, or the, the one uh, that you got the most involved in, um, the, the fact that wars drag, uh, have shaped drug consumption patterns uh, long after the wars were over. Oh. Yeah. Can, yeah, can you tell us more about that? Yeah, the, I, I sort of outlined what the different um, dimensions of the drug war relationship are. And the last one I mentioned was drugs after war. So that the, the war and drugs don't just matter during wartime itself, but the legacy of war um, is really quite profound. I mean, if we think about, well, why is cocaine even prohibited today? Uh, you can't explain that without World War II because Japan had a thriving legal cocaine industry, uh, which was wiped out along with the defeat of Japan uh, in World War II. And so what replaces legal cocaine is, is the US preference for criminalization of cocaine at the global level, which only comes with the victory over, uh, over Japan, but also then US uh, power and influence uh, expanded globally, which in included in imposing to some degree it's certain drug prohibition preferences. Um, if we look at our own history here in the United States, you know, this was a rum drinking country during the colonial era, it was a British colony. Rum was the preferred uh, uh, alcoholic beverage of choice. Uh, but in the aftermath of the American Revolution, rum is associated with the British drink. It uh, requires foreign imports to produce um, uh, molasses from the, from, from the Caribbean. Uh, and so the country turns inward towards whiskey, which becomes a sort of a sign of independence. You can pr use it producing corn, especially with westward expansion. It's cheaper. Uh, and so uh, we turned into a whiskey drinking country, partly because of, 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 of the revolution. Same with shifting from tea to coffee. The United States basically went from being a uh, caffeinated beverage of choice was tea uh, during the British rule uh, to um, especially after supplies of coffee were secured from, from the Americas after um, they were, uh, you know, Brazil and so on in the later 19th century. Um, basically the biggest coffee drinking country in the world in terms of just amount of Im imports. So the rise of caffeine as uh, coffee as, as the sort of caffeinated beverage of choice is also a product of, of of war, and just if you go back even further in history, I mean, why is France the world's you know most famous wine producing country? It's because of Roman conquest. The the, the Romans are no, no. Not. It's because the the French wines are the best. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, I mean, the, the Romans introduced the grape to the wine to to um, uh, to France, and uh, what's fascinating is is that legacy endured even after the the Roman Empire retreated. Uh, though actually alcoholic beverage choices fragmented in the uh, retreat of, of Rome. So beer made a massive comeback as Rome retreated, interestingly. Um, so again, you can just see how, how different drugs have been influenced by um, uh, long after the, 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 the battle's end that, that they keep going. That's really fascinating. And, and so what can, I mean, we've looked at the past, we've looked at the present. So what can that tell us about the future? Uh, if you look at the, the history of drug war relationship, can you tell us anything about what's next for us? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, we I'm not, don't have a crystal ball and I'm, I, I, I feel uh, uh, reluctant to, to make bold predictions, but based on the history, I think it's fair to say that the drugs war relationship not only remains alive and well today, but will endure well into the to the future. Um, but different drugs will emerge. Um, uh, the dimensions that I outlined, some will be more important than others. I think there's been a shift we've seen towards uh, non-state actors, uh, which gets all the attention today in terms of being empowered by by various drugs, prescription drugs. 
uh, mm -hmm. you know, becoming far more important than, uh, than you know, in earlier centuries, obviously. Um, the state still is a, you know, in some ways the, the, the soldiers are getting their pills typically from, from states. So they don't, you know, in, it's interesting in, in, in Vietnam, you know, US soldiers got a bad rap because they were also, many of them were heroin addicts. Um, but today you get your opioids prescribed uh, as painkillers uh, directly from, from the government uh, to deal with your, your wounds, often ones that in previous uh, historical years would have killed you, but you survived, but, because, but now on intense painkillers, uh, you come back home and uh, you put on all sorts of drugs just to cope with the scars of war, psychologically and physically. And then some of them actually then turn to um, heroin and other illicit drugs as part of that. So part of the, the current opioid crisis in the U.S. is also a, a, a war story of returning veterans. That's, that's really, really fascinating. Thank you. And, and I'm sure that the audience has a lot of questions for you, but I'll, I'll use my privilege to ask one last question. Uh, if, uh, what's, uh, what do you want people most to remember about your book? Is there one big takeaway that you have? I suppose it, back to that Tilly-esque line, you know, drugs made war and, and, and war made drugs, which is I'd like to convince people who haven't put a lot of thought into this subject that you really can't fully understand the history of, of war without bringing drugs more front and center in the analysis. I don't mean to drug the analysis, if you will, um, or simplify it, but it really uh, strikingly important uh, role putting it front and center in the history of warfare. And similarly, people interested in the history of drugs need to need to think war is a, is a major catalyst and influencer in terms of what drugs we consume, why, where, how, when, and so on. So yes, drugs made war and war made drugs. And that's really easy to remember. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I already have two questions, so I'm going to call on people. And when, when I call on you, if you don't mind unmuting yourself, obviously, to ask your question, but also turning on your camera so that uh, Peter can see you. Um, but please don't send them through the chat. Uh, raise your hand. Thank you so much. So Jim, you were the first one. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Peter. I enjoyed reading your book uh, a couple of months ago. Um, I just wanted to correct you on the cannabis issue in Vietnam. A Medal of Honor win winner uh, proclaimed that he was high on marijuana when he won the Medal of Honor <laughs> in Firebase uh, in Three Corps. And also in uh, Vietnam in 1970-69, uh, you talk about heroin. It used to be sold in cigarette packs. We used to call them OJs after OJ Simpson. So you mm. could actually buy different brands and intensities of heroin packed into cigarettes and you know, usually the NCOs didn't know anything about this. It was sort of funny. Uh, but my question is uh, the issue of methamphetamines. Okay. Uh, recently, I've been reading uh, a book uh, about Hitler in the period up to Barbarossa. And to use a 60s term, uh, you know, he was sort of in a mixed bag all the time. You know, he was using opiates, he was using methadrine, etc. But in general, as you know, and, and if you could share with us, this was a policy of the Third Reich in general to develop methamphetamine for combat. And so I'm wondering what you have to say about that and also Hitler's addiction. Yeah, um, thank you for that. Great uh, comments and, and question. Um, I know your main question is about meth, but I, one thing about your Vietnam comment, um, it, a couple things. One is, some soldiers in Vietnam shifted from uh, marijuana to heroin precisely because uh, testing was introduced and it was much easier to detect uh, marijuana uh, in urine uh, than, than heroin. So unintentionally, uh, US policy of, of testing more soldiers ended up shifting people to, to um, heroin to some extent. And then secondly, there was, you know, the heroin itself was local and so it's extremely high potency and therefore meant you could smoke it. And when the soldiers returned home, the vets returned home, one argument is they actually kicked their habit to a remarkably successful degree. And some speculation out there, research as well, is the having to turn to a needle was actually an, an, an inhibitor. It certainly, you know, 
just intuitively I can I can see. Uh, let me let me interrupt you. I worked with veterans at that time, mm -hmm. and the problem was that uh, New Yorkers were already used to heroin. It was those kids from other parts of the United States that didn't use heroin that they had problems with the needle. Right. And it, right, it was 80 to 90% pure, the opium that was in those, uh, no, those yep. heroin joints. Exactly. Yeah, and then on to your main question, which is, you know, meth in, in, in Germany. Um, Hitler was a, was a junkie dictator. I mean, he had his own personal doctor that gave him injections, concoctions of a wide variety of, of, of medications, they, and they shifted all the time. Uh, official German ideology was, was intensely anti-drug except for meth, because it made you alert, energetic, it sort of gave you kind of superhuman qualities, and they doled out these the pills millions of pills to soldiers on the battlefield. Um, and it was arguably an essential ingredient in the, in, in the, in the Blitzkrieg. Uh, literally, you know, you move faster and you move faster for longer periods of time without needing sleep. Um, what I find, I mean, Norman Oler is a sort of a German journalist who's done the most work on this. And he wrote a book that did quite well a few years ago called Blitzed. And it was all about drugs in Nazi Germany. But one corrective that I think is, is needed, it, it's, or, or just sort of fill in the, the picture, is it wasn't just the Germans. I mean, basically, they maybe pioneered pill popping on the battlefield in World War II in terms of meth, but the, the Brits started doing it, the Americans uh, were doing it as well, and then the Germans actually tapered off, uh, whereas the Allies actually continued use um, in, in large doses, and then well into the Cold War period, the U.S. military was was doling out large quantities of, of, of amphetamines long after they were no, no longer uh, accessible except through prescription from doctors. So um, I don't want, you know, you're, yes, uh, you know, uh, Nazi Germany was totally revved up on, on meth and kind of pioneered it in a way uh, on the battlefield, but um, it was much more widespread, it turned out, during World War II and, 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 and certainly well into the Cold War period. Thank you so much. Uh, Thomas, you're next. Maybe unmute. Yeah, I try. Yeah, I think I did that. I can't seem to turn on the video, though. Oh, well. Hey, Peter. Hey, Tom. Um, nice to see you. Good I to see you. Uh, no video, just a picture. I'm trying. Oh, there, there I am. Okay. There you are. Okay. Hey, Peter. Um, so I don't know whether your book does a lot of domestic uh, conflict, violence. You know, you talked about gangs in, in various places, but it seems to me from the social science perspective that a, a key variable that, that varies sharply is just whether something's legal or illegal. And if it's illegal, it, it, it favors the use of violence to protect it um, by subnational actors. If it's legal, it's, you know, it's taxed. So the two, the two variables I would look for is, is something legal in one period and illegal in the next? And does that change the patterns of violence uh, greatly? And the other one would be the taxation level. You say the Russians were funding their military on, on alcohol taxes. If you tax something uh, too greatly, it has a similar effect uh, to uh, making it illegal because you still are, are um, uh, giving great benefit to the use of militarized groups to run that product without paying taxes. Right. Uh, so I just wonder if, if, if your book goes into that at all and whether you've seen real examples of the entire dynamic changing because uh, one state or more than one state decided to uh, change a drug from legal to illegal. I know the opium wars and I'm a China guy. So, you yeah. know, China made opium illegal and it changed everything. Um, exactly. In fact, that yeah. was part of my answer. You preempted me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think about yeah. China all the time. Tell me about other places. Yeah, I mean, the, the, well, it's, this is not just for you. I mean, the, the op you know, it's not just the opium wars, though, Tom. It's basically, if you just look in the early 20th century, you know, uh, this is when opium transitioned from a legal drug to a criminalized drug. And you're absolutely right. That's when you see basically Chinese warlords uh, in the in the early 20th century, basically getting fun, essentially funding themselves 
through this newly criminalized uh, uh, commodity that um, now there were international agreements around it and people like Chiang Kai-shek were formally uh, uh, for the bans, but in practice were actually funded, funded through it. What's fascinating is uh, China's, uh, the Chinese revolution was followed up by the most draconian war against drugs the world has ever seen in term, and it's probably the most successful war against drugs we've, we've and never given credit for, frankly. In terms of, no one thinks of China when they think of, you know, the successful war on drugs, but it pushed it all to Southeast Asia. Uh, and so the golden triangle and the boom in opium production there and, and, and uh, all that history was actually a product of the Chinese revolution. And there, again, the transition from legal to illegal um, the French authorities in, um, you know, then French uh, uh, Indochina um, were taxing the stuff. Uh, but as it was criminalized, French intelligence continued to use it as a source of informal funding for their favored, you know, parties. Um, then it becomes fully criminalized. So basically, the tra it also invites corruption all sorts of uh, so on. And then as you're, you're absolutely right, um, as it's less and less sort of formally taxable, one could say that it leads to informal forms of taxation, right? Um, through uh, looking the other way, Afghanistan today, arguably is, you know, we have, we could, we, you know, it's not like opium's out of control in Afghanistan. There's lots of authorities basically informally taxing opium there on all sides. Yeah, but you mentioned you mentioned how how Mao's crackdown on drugs affected Southeast Asia. Um, so did the Taliban's crackdown on, on opium uh, when it when it ruled Afghanistan. Indeed. A lot more opium was grown in Southeast Asia, and it, it led to a lot of drug gangs down there as well. Yep. Um, the, I mean, the basic. I mean, the, the China sort of exhibit A of this is where you can trace from legal to to um, illegal, but. I mean, there's also examples, uh, you know, cocaine doesn't really become a, a major funder of conflict until it's not just criminalized, but until it becomes a sort of extraordinarily profitable transnationally shipped commodity. And so that's a relatively recent historical story. It's but, not like- But those two things are related, right, Peter? The reason it's so profitable is that it's illegal. In other words, cocaine wouldn't be expensive if it wasn't if you didn't go to jail for 20 years, if you got caught with it. Yeah, absolutely. Having said that, alcohol was, is extremely profitable and legal. Uh, tobacco has historically been extremely profitable and legal, but you're right, prohibition inflates profits beyond, well beyond what they would be normally in a, in a more free market or regulated market environment. Thanks a lot, Peter. I'm standing down. I, 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 I overstayed my welcome, but thanks. Thank it's great to see you. Really. Tom. Cheers. Thank you. And, and now, Paige, you have a question. I'm sorry, who? Paige, Paige Fortna. Fortna. Oh, hi, Paige. Hi, Peter. How are you? Good to see you. Um, actually, my question follows on uh, quite well from Tom's question. Um, as you were talking, I was thinking about, um, I'm really struck by the fact that you're looking at both legal and illegal drugs, which is um, you know, not generally done, which is great. Um, and my question uh, was about how much war has to do with whether war, whether drugs are legal or illegal. And you gave the example of cocaine and Japan. Um, and I'm wondering if you see kind of uh, patterns there, whether there are you know, um, other examples or there's a tendency for wars to change the legality of drugs that maybe helped fuel them. Um, and in which, in which direction do drugs tend to become more illegal because right. of war? illegal because of war um, and and the and obviously the other way around too which is what Tom was getting at that you know legality whether a, whether a drug is legal or not affects the the effect it will then have on on war and then a follow-on to that does that um, from all the all the research that you've done on this um, does it push you in one way or another in terms of policy debates on legalization oh great question very Timely question. Um, um, well, first of all, um, you know, it's interesting. And part of the answer to your question is is ties back to Tom's question about about China. Which, um, what's interesting, the opium wars 
essentially started as an effort by China to actually criminalize opium, right? From the British perspective, they thought this is a perfectly legitimate, acceptable commodity, uh, help them balance trade and, and actually be able to pay for the tea that, that, that Brits were so fond of from China and China was the only source for quite a long time. Our uh, drug for your drug, basically. Right, it's actually, <laughs> yeah. Exactly, that's exactly what it was. Um, and, but China tried to declare it illegal or they did declare it illegal, but then tried to actually enforce that prohibition and which is what sparked the opium war. So it's basically one state saying uh, we are going to uh, outlaw it, another state saying no. And the outcome, especially of the second opium war, was to legalize, fully legalize the trade. And so there's an example of a dispute over the legal status of a drug. And ultimately, it's, it's legalized. But what's the interesting twist on that story is when China ultimately had to throw in the towel on, on legal status, the way it fought imports was import substitution. China became the largest producer of opium in the world by the, by the end of the 19th century. Uh, and it didn't, no longer needed Indian imports of, 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 of opium uh, at, at one point. So um, if you can't beat them, join them. Um, the, the issue of other examples of, of legality, I mean, there was that dramatic case story of, of of um, cocaine that I already mentioned. Uh, and then you mentioned the, the how, how does this tie into contemporary debates about, about legalization? I, you know, it's all about balancing policy priorities. I mean, right now it's clear that cocaine funds extreme violence, uh, especially in places like Mexico, but also in Brazil. Um, <clears throat> historically in Colombia, um, and Latin America has the highest rates of violence in the world. And it's not only because of drugs, but drugs are a major contributor. And then of the drugs that are a contributor, cocaine is, is number one. And then, you know, look over to Afghanistan. It's not a coincidence that this war plagued country is by far the world's leading source of opium to the world. Uh, so then you sort of have to say, hey, legalization, would that, you know, take care of it? And I, I, the simple answer is, is yes. But at what cost? Uh, public health, um, all, you know, there's the debate over legalization is quite broad, of which only one piece of that is, well, it will defund um, various illicit armed actors across, across the globe. Um, so it's not an easy answer, but it's pretty clear that you take away the profits, it ceases to become, a, I mean, it would still matter, but not nearly a, a, as much. I found it fascinating that some of the arguments for legalizing marijuana in the U.S., some people tried to argue that it would um, be a, a, a major blow to Mexican traffickers, right? So this is part of the legalization argument in the U.S. is just how, and Frankly, I think that was overstated. I think that you know they're 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 drug diversified, if you will. They're involved in amphetamines and marijuana and cocaine and and and, and heroin. Uh, and so you just wipe out marijuana, which is probably not their most important drug. It, it doesn't have that devastating of, a, of, a, of an impact. But ironically or interestingly, part of the argument for legalization in some some cases was it's gonna, gonna be a major blow to the, to the cartels. I'm, I'm zooming in from Portland, Oregon, where weed yeah, is right. legal. So <laughs> it's wafting in from the apartment building next to me as we speak, actually. Okay, well, Massachusetts, a few miles away is also legal. So. Yep, <laughs> thanks, Peter. It's moving it this way. So we have uh, not a lot of time left, uh, uh, and uh, we have four more questions. So let's uh, have Jim's question, and then Ariane, Rachel, and Jared. Um, why don't you send your questions through the chat? And Peter, if you don't mind, you'll uh, first answer Jim's question, and then uh, we'll, we'll uh, take the three last questions together, and then we'll wrap up the event. Uh, okay, so... So, Jim's, fir Jim's first. All right. Uh, I, 
My name is James. I'm a second year ISP student and one of the Salton PAs. As one of the co-hosts, I'm not able to raise my hand in the in the function. Uh, I, my question was, uh, goes back to if we focus on illicit drugs and separate from the orientation on the soldier, how do we see the drug war nexus factoring into primarily ideological conflicts and limited territorial conflicts? The two that come to mind are the Sino-Vietnam War and the Crimea conflict. Uh, thank you. Wow, I have, um, can you rephrase the first part of that question? Because the sure. um, conflict, I mean, you know, just because I think drugs and war have an intimate relationship across time and place historically, it doesn't mean that absolutely every conflict everywhere has a drug connection that matters and worth talking about. So I actually don't know uh, uh, what the drug link would be in the Crimea, except for the fact that uh, Russian soldiers, um, not to stereotype too much, but in this case, it's, it's more than a stereotype, are particularly fond of drinking uh, uh, and long, have long been so uh, historically. So, um, but I, I'm not, there may be a drug link there that I'm aware of, but I, I just don't know. But what was, the, I, what was the first part of the question? The, um, the whether if we remove ourselves from the orientation on the soldier, I was wondering if how the drug war nexus plays into ideological conflicts. The one that came to mind was the Sino-Vietnam War. Okay. Um, again, I don't know what the Sino-Vietnam War, what the drug angle was in that particular conflict. I do know that, you know, China prided itself on going from being, you know, the largest, both simultaneously the largest opium producer in the world and the largest um, drug consuming country in the world to eventually virtually eradicating both those things, pushing it south uh, into, into, into Southeast Asia. Uh, but I, to, to my knowledge, I mean, it, right now, China, you know, there's tensions between China and it, it's some of its southern neighbors over drug smuggling, drug trafficking today. But it's not really, um, you know, elevated to the, to the level of being a war story. Thank you. So Peter, we're still waiting to get uh, the questions from Ariane and Jared through the chat, but uh, can you see Rachel's question? Oh, let's see. Okay, the chat. I'm, I'm not only new to this uh, Zoom, giving a talk by Zoom, but using Zoom in general. So the chat function is... Then uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it go. for you. I, so I'm on here. So, Ray, um, my, okay. So my question is where this is from Rachel. Um, where should the policy response to combat violence associated with drug politics in Latin America come from? Um, do you believe international organizations like the UN should lead the response or should it come from local federal government of those states? Um, and then the second in Crimea, all sides were into heavy drinking. Yes. That was not a question. No, no, okay. So just. Um, In response to Rachel's question, where should the policy response to combat violence um, associated with drug politics in Latin America come from? Ideally, policy responses should come from within the country and the region. I mean, arguably, the international drug prohibition regimes have, um, and then the US self designated role in enforcing those prohibitions, sort of playing the, the policemen of the, of the Western Hemisphere, including in, in drug enforcement, has not um, facilitated uh, uh, you know, a constructive move, move forward. Uh, you know, having said that, um, there's no easy solution. That, uh, you're not about to see um, uh, uh, you know, a lot of ex-leaders of Latin American countries have come out in favor of drug legalization. Uh, but what's striking is how few current leaders who are actually in power uh, have done so. And even in Mexico, where um, the current president uh, basically came into power saying he wants a change, radical course. He wants some um, uh, uh, abrazos, not balazos, meaning hugs, not bullets in the drug war. Uh, in practice, it's actually been more continuity than change. Uh, and this is not 
a reflection of, of U.S. meddling or U.S. influence and so on. It's, it's within Mexican politics itself. Mm. Thank you so much, uh, Peter. I think uh, we're out of time. It's already past 1 p past 1 p.m. Um, so Ingrid, should we should we say thank you to everyone and end the event now? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us for this really fascinating conversation. Um, we hope to have Peter back again sometime soon. Um, if you want to uh, pose any more questions on the chat, we can try to follow up with Peter for you later. Absolutely, so, or you email me directly. That works too. Yeah. That Thank was a fascinating me. talk. Thank you so much, Peter. I appreciate it. Thank you it. so much, and stay Great. safe, and have a good afternoon. Likewise. Bye-bye.